This is my 1969 Saab 96, or most of it anyway. It's in the state you see here today because way back in October I was driving it along and I looked down at the coolant gauge and I noticed that my Saab had become incontinent and was overheating. So I pulled over, allowed it to have a short pee break, and then waited for a tow truck. Later on I found out the cause of my coolant leak was a failed water pump seal down there. So logically, I'm going to be replacing the entire engine. Why not? We live in a disposable society. No, I'm serious. Here's the new engine. Now before you think I'm completely crazy, let me walk you through the thought process I had to arrive at the conclusion of replacing the engine for just a simple failed water pump seal. Just about a week after the coolant leak occurred, I tried to fix the water pump, and while I was trying to take the water pump apart, I realized that the bolts on the back of it are really hard to access, so I had the thought, you know, this would be a lot easier if the engine was out of the car. You know, actually, if the engine was out of the car, I could replace the clutch, because the throwout bearing is a bit loud. So I decided to replace the clutch to justify taking the engine out just to make the water pump service a bit easier. But that still doesn't explain why I decided to replace the entire engine. Well that's because this is the engine out of my old Saab 96. It was the same year and even color as this one, but it was a complete rust bucket. I sold it to a Saab collector in Kentucky who has over two dozen Saabs, I think, and he had no need for this engine, so he just gave it back to me, which is awesome. And uh, I think it's in better condition. I haven't verified this. I haven't taken either engine apart very much, but I have had the valve covers off of both of these engines. And when I had the valve covers off the car, it was full of oil sludge, like someone hadn't changed the oil properly. And this one was clean as a whistle. So based on that modicum of information, I assume this engine is in better shape. And also, I'm not gonna be just taking the valve covers for their word. I'm going to be replacing all the seals in the engine. I have a full replacement engine seal kit for this engine, and I'm going to be doing that. I'm not going to be doing a full rebuild, just engine seals. And the piece de resistance, the thing that I'm most excited for is the upgrade that I've got, which is over there, I'll go get it real quick. This is the real exciting part, some upgrades. This is an intake manifold for a two-barrel carburetor. All of these Saab V4s are actually made by Ford, came from the factory with a single-barrel carburetor, and I'm going to be upgrading that to a two-barrel Weber carburetor. The first step in this project is also one of the most straightforward. Take the current engine that I'm not going to use out of the Saab and cast it aside like a greasy boat anchor. Now that the old engine's out of the Saab, is might as well start tearing into the quote-unquote new engine. As I mentioned earlier, I have a full seal kit for the whole engine. I'm not going to do a full rebuild or anything. I'm not going to replace the pistons or rebore it or any of that. I'm just going to replace all the seals, but that still requires most of the engine to be apart. So I might as well get cracking, as Ed China would say. goes the valve cover. Oh yeah. Clean. Clean-ish. Pop goes the second valve cover. He's a small wacky stick. And the intake manifold is off. Ah, 
There we go. Yep. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. Look at that gunk. Oh, that, that water pump will definitely need some cleaning. It looks like before the front timing cover comes off, I gotta get whoa, sump off. I thought that was drained of oil, but it wasn't. Oh. <laughs> well, everybody makes mistakes, especially me. I make a lot of them. Let me just zoom out on this action here. Yeah. yeah. Got a little bit of oil on the floor because I'm an idiot. Yeah, it's full of oil. Good Lord. How did I make that mistake? Why did I think it was empty? There it goes. And let's behold the glory within. Oh, yeah. Woo. I want to make it clear at this point that I am a novice. In fact, I'm so much of a novice. This is the first time I've ever done this on a four stroke engine. I messed with the Trabant's engine before, but that's as far as I've gone. This is more complex, obviously. But I just want to make it clear that I'm an entertainer and not an instructor, all right? It's worth noting, I've never had this engine running more than 10 seconds, if that. Time to remove the heads. Gonna need a breaker bar, probably. <clears throat> oh, oh my god! There <sighs> we go, one. <laughs> Hopefully these are not torqued to yield bolts. The Haynes manual did not say anything about them being such things, but you know, you never know. Look at that, it's an engine. It doesn't look too bad. I mean, it's, there's a bit of carbon buildup, obviously. I wouldn't expect it to be perfect. Uh, don't. Uh, this pit is a legitimate danger. And. Ta-da! Yep, that's how you get it out of there. Ah, that was the hardest one to get out for. All right, I flipped the engine around the engine stand and took off the flywheel where you weren't looking. But anyway, I have a gear puller now so I can take off the, this guy. All right. And the timing cover is now off. All right, I've hit a bit of a roadblock, but first let me tell you about these lovely timing gears here. This is the crankshaft gear. It's just a piece of metal, as you would expect. But these two gears, the balance shaft gear and the, crank, uh, the, 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 the camshaft gear, are made of some sort of fibrous composite material, which is really strange and very Swedish, even though it's, this is a Ford engine that was made in Germany. This is pretty cool. I guess they did this for lightweight reasons, because this is a pretty big, would be a pretty heavy part if it was made out of metal, but instead it's made out of some sort of fibrous composite. I've heard these online described as fiber gears and now I know what people are talking about. It's kind of interesting. Now the roadblock. This is really unfortunate. I cannot ignore it because it's the balance shaft. The balance shaft bearings are shot. Here's the play. I can't deal with that much play. And because it's the balance shaft and it's inherently out of balance and it's just going to 
make itself worse if the engine's running. This would probably be very loud and it's very likely the reason this engine or the whole car was put out of commission. If it gets too bad, as a matter of fact, it could even, it's, it may already be doing so, collide with the camshaft gear and because these are fibrous gears, they would absolutely shatter, shred themselves to pieces and it would be a catastrophic engine failure. So I have to fix the balance shaft bearings. Here's the plate in the balance shaft. It's quite substantial. To get this balance shaft out of here, you supposedly just tap on it. Right, if at first you don't succeed, try the exact same thing again. I always say there's nothing more dangerous than a confident idiot. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll screw the bolt in place and hammer on that. No, don't fall out. That was the trick. Well, here is the balance shaft. I managed to find a set of balance shaft bearings on eBay, so I ordered those and they'll be here in a couple of weeks. But in the meantime, I have several other things to do around the car. Some to accommodate for the new carburetor setup and others that I just needed to do. One of those things is the fuel pump. What I want to do is mount the electric fuel pump back here under the back seat, pushing fuel up to the mechanical fuel pump that's bolted on the side of the engine. Up until a few days ago, the electric fuel pump I had mounted on the front of the windshield washer bottle. Yeah, it was easy to access and it was temporary anyway, so it didn't really matter. Now, I want to use both fuel pumps because the mechanical fuel pump is there and it works and it's perfectly fine, so why not use it? And the electric fuel pump I want to add to that because of priming. So when the car's been sitting a while, the gas dries up and you have to crank the engine with the mechanical fuel pump to get the fuel to pump back up into the carburetor. With an electric fuel pump, I can just let it spin its wheels without the engine cranking over to prime the gas up to the engine. And I'll have both of them working in harmony. So I want the electric fuel pump back here under the back seat, pushing fuel up to the mechanical fuel pump that's mounted on the side of the engine. Testy poo over here. Hook up it, hook it up to power. And perfect. And here's the finished product. And because I just put some screws through the floor of the car, I'm gonna go underneath and Hit those exposed screws with a little bit of flex seal just to prevent any unneeded rust. I mean, it's not like this car is rust free, but why not? I'm under, gonna be under here. All right, I've had a bit of time to think about this whole balance shaft situation and I realized something. I'm an idiot. I ordered new balance shaft bearings because they were worn, but that ignores one half of the equation because if the balance shaft bearings are so worn that this balance shaft is just flopping around in the engine, then the balance shaft itself isn't going to come out unscathed. Sure enough, I measured the balance shaft itself, and it is indeed out of tolerance. Not by as much as I would have expected, probably because this is harder than the bearings, but it's still out of tolerance, and I can't use it. So what I've done is canceled my order of balance shaft bearings, and I'm not going to use this. What this all means is a pretty big change of plans, because I'm not going to be resealing the, the other engine that I had already stripped down, I'm going to start basically all over again from the engine I took out of the car. Now this is an engine that I've been driving with, so I know it works, which greatly reduces the probability of finding something catastrophically wrong with it once I take it apart. Now I have to strip everything down basically a second time, but at least I know more of what I'm doing this time, so that's, that's a plus. All right, this is the cursory visual inspection I did to this engine that made me think the other engine was better. There's a lot of sludge buildup in here, like a, a lot, including in the top of the head here. Yuck. 
so much sludge. There we go. There we go. There. We oh, that is a disaster. Whoo! That is sludgy. Oh my good lord! That's it's 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 burnt looking. Looks a little sludgy and burnt. Not quite as good as the other intake did, but well, this engine has a working balance shaft, so that that's a plus. Because the teardown of this engine is basically exactly the same as the teardown of the other engine that you already saw, I'll spare you all of it and skip straight to the end. I have come to a conclusion, which means I have changed my mind yet again, and the plan is changing again. I'm not going to use this engine like I said the first time I changed my mind. I'm going to use the engine out of my old rust bucket sob like I had originally planned and like I started with. But... The balance shaft in that engine is kaput. It's wobbling around in there like a hot dog in a hallway. This engine has a great balance shaft and it appears to even be brand new and the bearings as well. So I'm going, I've ordered a bearing puller off of Amazon. It should be coming soon. I'm going to harvest the good parts off of this engine, which are the balance shaft, the balance shaft bearing, the thermostat and nothing else. And I'm gonna be putting them on that other engine block and using it and reassembling that engine block. The reason for this change in plan is like I had originally suspected, this engine is in worse shape than the engine I started with. This was, the previous owner had this Saab 96 as their only car in Pittsburgh. Their only car was a 1969 Saab 96. That was a daily driver. And it looks like he not only abused it a little bit, he rarely changed the oil because there's oil sludge buildup all over this engine. Some of, a lot of it's baked on. A lot of it's caked on. There's lots of carbon buildup in the cylinders. And there's a pretty noticeable lip in the cylinder walls where the piston rings have stopped. So I'm gonna be using the other engine block. Simple. Got it. Look at this part. It's, it's shiny and new and great. That was dumb. <laughs> With the balance shaft out of the way, it's time to remove the balance shaft bearings. Now this is something I didn't know how to do, so I referenced my handy dandy shop manual, and it told me to see my local Saab dealer, which isn't very helpful. So I went online and asked the people on, of the internet this question, and I got some mixed answers. Some people told me to take it to a machine shop, and lugging two engine blocks to a machine shop didn't sound like a lot of fun, but one guy sent me a link to Amazon for this tool that I've ordered, it was only 80 bucks, and it's specifically a camshaft bearing removal and installation tool. It will work perfectly for this job. So that's what I'm going to use to take these old bearings out of here and put them in the other block. Tighten it up. What this is doing is expanding the bearing whacker around bearing. So there's a flange behind the bearing, and I just hit it with the wacky stick. Let's, let's hold the centering cone there. This is working incredibly well, actually. And the bearing is out. Whoop! Oh boy! Whoopsie! All right, I've put the engine from my old saw back on the engine stand, and I'm reminded yet again how much better shape this engine is in. There's substantially less oil sludge everywhere. There's no baked-on oil anywhere. And the aluminum pistons are aluminum colored instead of being completely varnished. With the bearing out of the engine, it's very easy to see that it's a bad bearing. Whatever material is on the inner surface is flaking off and almost completely gone. Whatever inner material was flaking off in the last bearing is completely missing on this bearing, which explains why the balance shaft was flopping around on the side that this bearing is on. So in the trash it goes. Now it's time to line up to install the bearings from the bad engine into this block, making careful note to line up the oil holes. Let's try to drive this in as straight as possible. I think that's good. Now obviously it would have been better to install brand new bearings into the engine block, but I'm going to use the excuse of recycle reuse. 
Yeah, I'm saving the planet by reusing those bearings. Actually, I just didn't want to wait for the new ones to ship because I want to get this done. But no, recycle, reuse, that's, that's the reason. I do install it very gingerly. Perfecto. Nice and rotating and zero wobble. Lining up the timing on this engine is incredibly easy because there's just a set of marks to line up. Right in there. Oh, now it's coming. There we go. Did I mention it's engine reassembly time? Because I don't think I did. Yeah, look at that. Use the old seal to install the new seal. Perfect. The better of two balance shafts is in here. The rear main seal is freshly installed. Now it's time to start reassembling the rest of the engine with new seals. Should be very exciting. Also mildly stressful because taking the engine apart is one thing, but putting it back together, I've never put a four-stroke engine back together before. There's first time for everything. If I do this right, then you probably can too. The timing cover itself has a little seal in it, so I need to get that out. Oh my god, it's meant to be. This is the destroyed stub axle from the Trabant, and it's almost the perfect size to drive out this seal. Ow! No, it wasn't the perfect size, it slipped straight through. Maybe I spoke too soon. Yeah! I think that was it. Did the seal... Yes, it did! Perfect. And the new seal is rubber instead of metal. I just need to... All right, new seal is in. Time for the water pump. The water pump out of the old engine was all gunked up and the water pump out of my Saab, the reason I stopped driving is because it had a coolant link. Now that could have been the seals. It probably was the seals, but it also could have been the water pump. So in, just to not take any chances, bought a brand new water pump. Yeah, splurged. This wasn't very expensive, but it's nice to have shiny new parts. And here's the other half. I think you're technically supposed to reassemble the water pump after you put the timing cover back on the car, but it's much easier to do it here. And just like that, new water pump. I also put some RTV on the timing cover, or transmission cover, as the book oddly calls it. Get that lined up there. There we go. All right, now it's snug. My lovely engine seal kit doesn't appear to have a gasket for the base of the oil pump here, so I guess I have to make my own. There, that's really awful looking. By the way, I did check the oil channels with compressed air. They all seem to be free flowing. There we go. Starting over here. Now just gently lower this on there and hope I didn't forget anything underneath here before securing the, ta the oil pan in place. That would be annoying. For reasons unknown to me, the two bolts right here on the oil pan are held in place with rubber washers. I don't know why that is, but the ceiling kit has two new rubber washers, so I'm gonna install them. If someone could let me know why it has rubber washers, if you do know, that would be pretty cool. Oil pan is on. What is next? The next thing to reinstall is the heads 
with the new head gaskets and everything, but the first step is to reinstall all the tappets in exactly the same location they came from. Boop. Boop. Now, as I said, these tappets weren't in perfect condition, but they'll be fine. I talked to someone else who has rebuilt many V4 engines before, and he told me not to worry about the tiny amount of pitting that was on the bottom of them. So I'm not going to. And the last one. And we go. If I was a surgeon, all of my patients would have infections. All right, and gently. Perfect. All right, head number one. All right, the engine is now heavier. Head number two. There we go. So the tightening pattern of the head bolts is as follows. One, two, three, four, five, oops, five, six. You have to tighten them in that order, but you tighten them down in three stages. The first stage is 40 pound-feet of torque to each one. The second stage is 50, and the third and final stage is 68 pound-feet of torque for all the head bolts. There we go. All right, 68. The heads are installated. Now time to assemble the heads themselves. Let me get the push rods. All right, that's all the push rods back in position. Each one of these, once I get it snug, torques down to 32 pound feet which is roughly half what the engine can put out. I think that's actually true. But it'll be more once I get my two barrel carburetor on there. It'll be pushing out at least 20 more, 10 more, I don't know. I don't know what kind of power gains I'm gonna see from this. I'm just doing it for fun. All right, I got the dork wrench set to 32 pound feetals. I just had an unfortunate realization. While I had the heads off of the engine and on their own. I should have cleaned the carbon off of them. I don't know why I didn't think to do this, but now I'm slightly upset because, well, there's nothing I can do now. I can't take them back off again. The head casket's already in place and crushed and everything. So um, I don't know what the purpose of me telling you this is. I'm an idiot, I guess. I should have cleaned off the carbon. Whatever, it doesn't matter. It's relevant. I need to adjust the valves now. All right, I have the rotation of the engine set to Cylinder one right here is at top dead center on its compression stroke, so I can adjust valves one, two, four, and six. Six in particular has quite a bit of play to it. Now what's fascinating about this, and I'm really curious about this, is the manual says these nuts here have an interference thread, so supposedly they don't need, well obviously they don't need any locking nuts to secure it in place. I don't know anything about this apparent interference thread design, but I'm very curious now is it just stays in place. I'm sure it'll be very stiff to move, but let's get going. Oh my God, good Lord. Yeah, that doesn't need a locking nut at all. What's holding that in? I wanna know how this thread works. These are out of adjustment, which is why I'm adjusting them. And the last valve. That one's not too bad, actually. Maybe the most well-adjusted of the bunch, and it's actually perfectly lined. Now it's time for the star of the show, my two-barrel carburetor intake manifold. This was incredibly hard to find. I could not find it online anywhere, so what I did is I called up, shout out to Paul Nielsen, and bought the part off of him. He's a sob collector. He just had one of these lying around. So I have one now, and I can fit it on the engine. It's very exciting. I also got the carburetor from him. There are these two little brass flanges that go under the intake manifold. The manual makes nary a mention of them. But they came out of both of these engines and there's a locating hole 
on the gasket itself. So I'm putting them back. Und sehr. Cork gasket doesn't fit very well in there, but you know what, it's good. You'll notice I didn't paint the valve covers. You'll get over it. And the next thing is the distributor, which simply just slots in like so. I looked in the book, the crankshaft has to be aligned to six degrees before top dead center on the compression stroke of cylinder number one. And then this guy has to be lined up with this little mark on the casing. Distributor's clamped down, it's not gonna go anywhere. I'm gonna go ahead and put the distributor cap back on because it'll make me feel more accomplished. Yeah, look how accomplished I feel. Just occurred to me this is the distributor cap from, no, this is the distributor cap and whole distributor from the engine I took out of the Saab. Not from this engine. Part sharing. It's what happens when you have two of something. Hey, hey, idiot, your microphone isn't working. All right, thank you, Mr. VoiceOver. A change of shirt appeared to fix the microphone. Not gonna question how that worked, but. Anyway, before I was so rudely interrupted by my VoiceOver. What's with all the fan noise? It's hot in here. <laughs> wimp. All right, anyway, before I was so rudely interrupted by my very rude and inconsiderate VoiceOver, I was explaining that I've got most everything on the top of the engine, except for the carburetor, so that I can see what gets in the way of the new carburetor setup. I've got the thermostat housing up here, the distributor, some lines, this bizarre twisty throttle linkage. Because this is a Saab we're dealing with, there's not a simple throttle cable. There's a series of linkages and rotations and twisty rods that lead up to the accelerator on the carburetor. I got a question why they did that. Seems to be just because they wanted to. But that's how it is, and I have to make the new carburetor work with that. Now let's put the new carburetor in place. Here's my fancy two-barrel Weber carburetor, and I'll just slot it right up on here. I already had to take off a tiny bit of this carburetor, which is over here somewhere. I had to take off this tiny throttle linkage on the back just to make it fit, because this was fouling on the distributor. This isn't really a problem because I couldn't use this anyway. Like I mentioned, the accelerator link linkage, I'm gonna have to fabricate something for that. So that's not too big of a deal. And I'll also have to fit a choke cable on here, but the real big difference here, the, the thing that's missing is, this is the base plate from the single barrel carburetor. This base plate serves two purposes. One is to prop up the carburetor slightly and make it feel slightly more important. The other one is to provide vacuum lines to the PCV valve for this valve cover. And this vacuum line goes to the power brake booster to give you, you know, power brakes. I don't have this for the new two barrel setup and the new two barrel intake manifold and all that. When I picked up the two barrel intake manifold that I have here, I was given the suggestion to uh, just tap some holes into it and run the vacuum lines off of that. Well, I don't wanna do that for two reasons. One, this intake manifold was incredibly difficult to find and two, there's not a lot of room in here anyway to do that. So I don't even know where I would tap the holes into. This carburetor sort of takes up this entire area where the old carburetor, there's tons of room around it. So I'm not gonna drill any holes in the intake manifold. What I'm gonna do instead is make my own base plate complete with vacuum channels and ports for the PCV valve and brake booster vacuum line. That's what I'm gonna do, or at least attempt it anyway. Let's see how this will go in the next episode, because that's going to be it for part one. Coming in part two, I abuse a drill press. A jigsaw abuses me. And my engine makes a noise.